Tonight is very special because we are welcoming one of the most active, I have the pleasure of welcoming one of the most active faculty members on campus and a huge contributor to the Institute for Latino Studies, including this summer's LSA conference and the courses she teaches and students she inspires in the supplemental major and minor. But first, let me introduce the person who's going to introduce our main speaker today. <laughs> <laughs> professor Francisco Robles is an assistant professor of English, Latino Studies, and Gender Studies here in Notre Dame. <clears throat> he teaches classes such as American Migrant Communities, Latinx Literature Now, Queer Migrations, and On the Move, Migration in American Literature. His peer-reviewed articles on Latinx literature and African-American literature can be found in, is it Mellis? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I got the pronunciation right. Mellis, Multi-Ethnic Literature of the United States, Post 45, Latino Studies, and 20th Century Literature. Other essays appear in Killing the Buddha, Post 45, Contemporaries, Ex Salon, did I get that right? Excellent, the, and the Journal of Popular Music Studies, and the collection Decolonizing Latinx Masculinity. His current writing projects focus on migration, aesthetics, deserts, and lamentation in Latinx poetry. Please join me in welcoming Francis, Professor Francisco Robles here to the podium. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, everyone, for being here. I'm deeply excited for this, uh, and for the unique honor not just of introducing Marisa Moreno, but also of getting the chance to ask her questions for you all, and then open up the floor for you all to ask questions at the end. So Marisa Moreno is a Reverend John A. O'Brien Associate Professor in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures at the University of Notre Dame. She's the author of Family Matters, Puerto Rican Women Authors on the Island and the Mainland, from 2012, and Crossing Waters, Undocumented Migration in Hispanophone Caribbean and Latinx Literature and Art, this year, 2022. She co-created the Digital Humanities Project Listening to Puerto Rico and the exhibit Art at the Service of the People, posters and books from Puerto Rico's Division of Community Education, Iberto. And just very quickly, I'm so eager to start talking about this book and what it's going to be doing for borderline studies in particular. What Maricel offers, for those of you who have read the book, or for those of you who are here for the conversation, is I think a brand new look at what Borderland Studies could be, what it can offer, and actually what it should offer. So please join me in welcoming Maricel Moreno. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you to uh, the Institute for Latino Studies, to Luis, Paloma, Maribel, the students who have helped plan the event, IRR, the Initiative on Race and Resilience. Everyone, thank you. Uh, and thank you for taking time to be here today. So what I am going to do is basically uh, provide an overview of what I do in the, in the book. and say enough so that you get some idea about it, but not enough so that you're still interested in buying the book. <laughs> so. <laughs> OK, so um, I just want to start with <clears throat> this um, image, right, uh, from, the, from the news uh, regarding a, a group of people who were rescued um, some of them died near Puerto Rico, and this happens to be, uh, I just wanted you to have a visual of what it is. It's called Isla de Mona, Mona Island, uh, and it's part of Puerto Rico. Um, so a lot of, you know, I'll be talking about this um, later on, and I can get into more details later, but a lot of um, undocumented migrants uh, traveling to Puerto Rico sometimes get uh, dropped off there and told by the smugglers that they have arrived, you know, to Puerto Rico. And technically they have because it's part of Puerto Rico, but 
it's a desert island. Um, there's nothing there, there's no fresh water, so the conditions are very difficult for people to survive. Um, so, like always, I like to start with maps. My students know this, just to get a visual of where we are, what we're talking about. And here's Puerto Rico, and this stretch here, here's Isla de Mona, this stretch here between Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic is called uh, El Canal de la Mona, the Mona Passage. And it's known as one of the most dangerous stretches of uh, water uh, worldwide, actually. Um, so that's what uh, many migrants uh, have to cross in order to make it to Puerto Rico, but more later. Um, and here's just another um, image just to show the, um, that Puerto Rico is an archipelago, right? Um, it is uh, composed of the main island, what we know as Puerto Rico, tend to call Puerto Rico, but there's also Vieques and Culebra, and you have Bona Island, you have Monito, Desecheo, Caja de Muertos, you know, so it's, a, it's an archipelago. Um, so this picture I took a couple summers ago when I was visiting, and it was pretty um, striking to me because it was the first time that um, I had actually seen Border Patrol. I don't usually frequent those areas. Um, so, um, I engaged in some dialogue with the Border Patrol agent and he explained that, yeah, you know, there had been some activity, so they were on the lookout. And interestingly enough, you know, after a few hours, we were like beach hopping that day. <laughs> and uh, in another town, at another beach, saw him again. So they were like, wow, they're really looking, right? And that was really impactful because I had not seen that, you know, and again, I had a chance to talk to him for a little bit. Um, but it's usually, it was usually the same type of re rhetoric, you know, about the people coming. Um, and this happened here. Um, the pictures were taken in Isabela and in Aguadilla, okay? So the western uh, and northwestern side of the island, the main island. Um, this happened uh, also, well, May 16 of 2021. This is a... a a tweet that went viral because someone at a beach during the day captured uh, the uh, disembarking of a group of uh, undocumented uh, immigrants, believed to be Dominican, but it turned out later uh, the Border Patrol corrected that it, they were mostly Haitian. And <clears throat> there were a couple of Dominicans with them. But the interesting thing about this, was, it was really striking. I was in the, in the process of uh, kind of putting some finishing touches on my, in my book, honestly. Uh, so I, I wrote a little bit about it in the epilogue uh, because it was a really striking moment for me. Uh, first of all, to see that process. Um, when you play the video, you see them disembarking and running for their lives, right? Um, but this is something that usually happens at night, you know, uh, in the cover of darkness because people are trying to, you know, not be detected. So the fact that it happened on a Sunday, this was beach day. There were families, you know, uh, tons of families uh, at the beach, um, and the video was captured. It's it's pretty unique. Um, so, in terms of um, the goals for for my book, um, I have quite a few, uh, but I would say that um, top goals would be to bring attention to the humanitarian crisis taking place in the Caribbean. Um, I'm talking about the deaths and all the violence that happens as a result of uh, undocumented migration uh, within the Caribbean. Um, I also am interested in showing how literature and art humanize, uh, humanize undocumented migrants because the rhetoric tends to be, you know, very dehumanizing. So I specifically am looking at works of art that help um, reclaim the humanity of the people uh, involved in this type of migration. I'm also interested in centering the Caribbean in discussions of uh, the border and border studies in general, because I think that's uh, really lacking uh, when we talk about the field of border studies. <clears throat> and last but not least, um, also to center blackness in discussions of intra-Caribbean migration, because 
not all, but most of the people who are affected and who, who attempt to cross um, tend to be uh, people who are black or people of color, okay? So those are some of my main goals um, with the book. And this is just an overview um, of the chapters, you know, the first, well, first the introduction, then the first chapter uh, provides more uh, theorization. You know, I talk about uh, what are some of the main concepts that I use in, in the analysis. Um, and that section ends with a brief history of um, Dominican migration to Puerto Rico, Haitian migration to the Dominican Republic, Cuban migration too. Um, so that's a very useful uh, part of that chapter for me. Um, then uh, second chapter, I focus on Puerto Rico and the role that it plays as a both border and bridge to the continental United States. Then I move on to the Dominican Republic and I look at two types of migration in that context. The first one being migration from the Dominican Republic to Puerto Rico. So crossing the, the Mona Passage, for instance. But the other side is also Haitian migration to the Dominican Republic, uh, undocumented, right? So I, I talk about that. And then last, um, well not last, but chapter four is, Cuba, is about Cubans. Um, and more specifically about the rafter crisis, the Balsero crisis uh, that happened in 1994. Okay, so uh, again, looking at works of art and literature that have to do with that. And finally, an epilogue. So that's just the basic, um, um, you know, um, outline of what I do. So in terms of um, what are some of the you know, um, ideas or uh, phenomena that are impulsing this study for me. Um, Crossing Waters, you know, to me, um, is a book that, that exists because of the urgent circumstances surrounding unauthorized migration in the Caribbean. And this is a phenomenon that is fueled by uh, the crisis of anti-blackness across the Caribbean. It's also fueled by climate change. Um, and that's only going to get worse um, as time goes on. And also due to the political and economic uh, upheaval beginning at, in the late 20th century. So I'm talking about the conditions at these specific islands that led to mass migrations. Um, so uh, the works I examine also challenge the view of the Caribbean as a paradise. So that's another idea that I en engage with because you know, when you talk to the <laughs> any random person, right? And you say, you know, what do you think of when you think of the Caribbean? You know, they're going to say beaches and vacation and piña coladas probably. And who knows what else, you know, fun stuff. But no one's thinking of what's really happening, right? So, um, so I want to show through my study how um, these, wor these uh, works of art and literature uh, represent the, the Caribbean as a border slash borderland, because it's both. Um, it's also a region where death is a constant. And it's also a place where the archipelago of Puerto Rico uh, becomes a stepping stone or springboard, right, to the continental US. And in that role, I see Puerto Rico, I, I talk about it as a disruptor of US empire because it's kind of undermining uh, some of the hopes that the US has for that region in terms of controlling and militarization, et cetera. Um, so I focus on the process of crossing waters. So like, I'm really interested. I mean, there's some exceptions, but I'm really interested in that moment of in-betweenness when, because there's so much out there about the before and about the after, but not enough about that in-between moment um, when people are at sea and what happens. And, and there's so many reasons for that, right? Um, there's a lot of unknowns uh, and sometimes people don't survive <laughs> the journey too. So, so I do this uh, with several aims, and one of them is 
again, thinking of the Caribbean and, and water as borderland to unsettle the centrality of the Mexico-US border um, in, Latino, in Latinx studies, and also to examine the parallels between these regions. So there's, you know, there's a lot happening in the Caribbean, and I think it's really time to engage in more conversations that, um, you know, lead to comparative studies um, and interdisciplinary studies, you know, to, to look at what's happening in these two regions, because there are more connections that, than one may think. Um, I also am interested in bringing attention to the fact that history is also made at sea. I mean, this is not my idea, um, but there's such a focus on, on history happening on land, right? Um, so I want to just come back to this idea that history is also being made at sea. Um, and also to disrupt the pattern of, along with that, uh, privileging lands and continents um, in archipelago and island studies. So like I'm, I'm looking at archipelago studies and island studies and border studies and just kind of trying to see uh, how they um, come together. Um, and one of them, one of the ideas that prevails is how, uh, even with archipelago studies and island studies, the relationship, you know, there's island to island or island to continent or water to land, right? So always land and continents tend to be privileged. So I'm trying to do what's not usually done, which is focus on island island and water. Um, I also engage with the trope of the Middle Passage uh, because it's something that recurs uh, in many of the works, uh, both literature and art, that I uh, examine in the book. And so in these works that I examine, uh, what I'm seeing is that many of them are affirming the African roots of the Hispanophone Caribbean, right? So I'm talking about Puerto Rico, uh, Cuba, Dominican Republic and its diasporas, um, or their diasporas, right? Also, I see that these works are resisting internal and external denials of blackness. And let me tell you what I mean by that. So internally, they contest uh, the amnesia that erases blackness from Caribbean roots in favor of Hispanismo or Latinidad or the idea of mestizaje um, as whitening ideologies. This is basically to say that there's a lot of <laughs> racism uh, in the Caribbean, and I know that because, well, in the case of Puerto Rico, where I grew up, right? Um, very, very open, um, anti-blackness, and so I see these works by emphasizing uh, the African roots of the people involved in these crossings. It's a way to really center blackness in the in Caribbean uh, and Latino Caribbean works. Uh, but also externally, um, the works I analyze also insist on centering the Hispanophone Caribbean in conversations um, about what has been traditionally been more like an Anglo-centered uh, Black Atlantic. So if we think about the Middle Passage and, and, um, and all of the um, critical production around it, oftentimes, well, I think the majority of the times um, is very Anglo-centered and the Hispanophone Caribbean tends to be relegated, like not really thought about that much. And um, this connects to uh, the idea uh, of um, uh, hegemonic blackness that um, Lorgia Garcia Peña is talking about in her newest book that just came out, right? Um, she gave it a good name. I, <laughs> that's what I meant. <laughs> uh, I just went around. Uh, okay, so. Also, uh, some of the works, I just wanted to let you know that some of the works I examine in the book um, memorialize the seafloor uh, as, as the final resting place for the lives lost uh, in the Caribbean 
during the Middle Passage and uh, in contemporary unauthorized or undocumented crossings. So many of the works echo uh, the Middle Passage, have echoes of the Middle Passage. So I, I was, you know, um, trying to dig a little deeper to understand what's behind this. Um, so it, it's all connected that way. So I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go through all of my slides. I don't even know how I'm doing with time. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about uh, Tony Capellan uh, a little bit, but um, maybe we can look at some of the other slides later. So Tony Capellan, his work, um, the work that I analyzed by him in, in my book is titled My Mar Caribe, it's an installation. And as, I, as you can see, it's made of flip-flops. So the artist uh, unfortunately passed away uh, recently, uh, well, a couple, few years ago, um, too early. But a lot of his art uh, is based on, like he makes these installations based on objects he picks up along the beaches, um, or used to pick up along the beaches uh, of Santo Domingo or uh, the banks of the Osama River. So he makes this uh, installation that is made of flip-flops, right? Um, using the, well, selecting them, uh, strategically using, you know, uh, sandals with different, you know, hues of blue and green to really evoke the the beauty, the colors, right, of the Caribbean Sea. There is so much meaning, so, you know, I get into the details of, you know, all of the symbolism behind the flip-flops. They're not new. It's not like he went to a store and bought a bunch of new flip-flops. These are things he found. They're considered trash by most of us, but he made uh, an art piece out of this. So each one of them carries uh, the stories, the, the, the dirt, you know, of the people that, that use them. So they each represent an individual life. Put together, they represent a collectivity. Obviously, a sandals, you know, there's, you know, we use them for walking. So there's the whole idea of movement and migration. Again, each one represents a life, a crossing, but seen together, it points to a mass movement of people. Right, uh, so the Caribbean as a place of movement. So, you know, I never saw this in person. I would have loved to, but I can imagine that seeing it would have been a very wonderful experience. Just thinking, wow, that's really pretty. I mean, but then you look really closely and the straps are not straps. They're, well, they're, they're made out of barbed wire, okay? So again, so much symbolism behind there, behind that, but one of my readings, um, and I spent a, a few pages uh, in this specific work, um, obviously the, the barbed wire as a, um, a material that is used uh, along the border, right? Um, that's a fence, you know, to keep people uh, from separated, divided. Uh, it's also something like if you wear these sandals, you're going to get hurt, right? They're going to draw blood. Um, there's suffering implied in using these. And seen together, they really metaphorize the idea of the Caribbean Sea as a border. It's like don't cross, right? Um, so this is uh, one of the works that, the first one uh, in terms of um, um, installations, like non-literature works that I analyze in the, in the book. Uh, I'll just go quickly. I'm not gonna say much about any of this because we need to get to the next part. Uh, I just wanted to give you <clears throat> a little bit of an overview. Oops. <clears throat> Sandra Ramos from Cuba. Um, again, these are all works that, um, that in one way or another connect with the idea of crossing waters, crossing the Caribbean uh, in this very um, 
um, precarious um, vessels. So I will leave it there. And I'm happy to, to answer questions, but now we'll go to the next thing. <laughs> So I'm very excited for this part. Um, I did send these questions to myself beforehand, so they're good ones, according to her. Um, they are good, yes. <laughs> so the first question is, how did you become interested in this topic? OK, so there's two answers to that. Uh, the first answer is that I just remember, I, I think I've shared this with my students. I remember growing up in Puerto Rico, being a little girl, and seeing the headlines constantly, you know, of so many drowned people crossing or Dom Dominican, so many, you know, rescued or mm. intercepted, whatever. Like, it was always in the news, right? So you grow up seeing that on the front page of the newspaper and it really, you know, has an impact. Um, so as a child, I just remember just being really surprised that this was happening, extremely confused, I couldn't understand. Because, uh, yeah, I, I thought it was scary, I still do, um, the whole idea behind it, so, so that was part of it, right? So fast forward to grad school and Latino studies and all of that, and I start reading, you know, so much uh, in grad school about the border, the border, and, and border theory, and border studies, and. And everything is about the Mexico-US border. Everything, everything, everything. And so again, I'm starting to, so it just kind of, it's there and it's kind of bugging me. Like, why is no one talking about the people who are crossing the Caribbean uh, in makeshift vessels, you know, and, and dying too, mm. or being intercepted, et cetera. And yeah, one thing led to another. Um, even as I was working on my first book, um, the, first, the first piece I published around this topic was an essay in Spanish about Mayra Santos Febres' poetry collection titled Both People, which was the first word, and I decided to write about it because <clears throat> it struck me. I read that, um, that uh, poetry collection, and it was the first time that I was seeing in Puerto Rican literature someone treating the subject of undocumented migration with such dignity and mm. uh, compassion. There had, I mean, it's not like the topic was um, not present in Puerto Rican letters before that, but it was dealt more with humor, okay? Um, so this was a completely different thing for me and it inspired me to write a, a, an essay, so that would be like the actual mm. intellectual genesis of the project, mm. you know, that one essay that I went back to, and that's where I tried to, my, those were my first attempts to try to think of border theory and how it mm. actually does not apply to mm. the, the situation where the context of an archipelago, mm -hmm. right? And then dealing with that, like, mm. so what do I do, you know? Um, mm. Anyway, so that, it goes back. <laughs> yeah. Well, now that I'm on camera, I can say this. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Mayra Santos Febres is probably one of the greatest living authors. Um, rarely read in the US, but one of the best writers alive. Um, it's on camera now, so. And, <laughs> so the next question I have is that you state that part of your book's ambition is expanding border studies via the Hispanophone Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So you touched on that a little bit just now, but could you explain why it's so important to talk about the Caribbean in border studies? Yeah. And in particular, the Hispanophone Caribbean. Yeah. OK, thank you for that. Um, well, border studies is an established discipline. I mean, it's been around for, mm -hmm. for decades. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're, that's your area too. Mm -hmm. um, and it continues to be relevant. It's only gaining even more relevance as time goes on. And we see it, we're continue to see more people displaced for different reasons, um, not the least of which is climate change, right? So again, I talked about the, the focus, I mean, mm -hmm. and this is no discovery, everyone knows that the focus of uh, uh, um, border studies is really the Mexico-US border, which is a land border. Mm -hmm. um, 
I mean, the river is there in some parts, but overall. And that, and there's nothing wrong, right, <laughs> with focusing on that border, but the tendency is then to then erase mm -hmm. any other border or mm -hmm. any other region where migration, mm -hmm. that any other region, region where migration is taking place and works as a border. Mm -hmm. So in this case, what I'm, you know, saying is the Caribbean is uh, is playing that role, right? And w I just don't think that we can keep um, downplaying mm -hmm. the seriousness of the situation of what's happening there, and kind of forgetting looking the other way. I mm -hmm. think it's time that we really look at what's mm -hmm. happening. Um, there are too many lives being lost uh, every year, and um, so yeah, borders in the end, you know, they're they're very complex, and but we need to make room for uh, other types of border that don't necessarily fit that paradigm that the Mexico-U.S. border represents, mm -hmm. and it's just going to enrich Latino studies more yeah. and and all the fields that are connected, right? Mm -hmm. uh, when we start mm -hmm. drawing more connections and and doing that kind of work. So hopefully this will inspire some mm -hmm. people to take that on, you know, from dis different disciplines. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I actually remember one of the parts of the books you cite uh, Silvia Torres Sayant, who says, mm -hmm. uh, he plays with uh, Gloria Saldúa's, and you point this out, mm -hmm. a really famous formulation of the U.S.-Mexico border as una herida abierta, mm -hmm. and he calls it una herida cicatrizada, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah which is just brilliant, and I think yeah. gets to what you're saying about the ways that this is a wound that keeps recurring, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One brief thing, too, um, in terms of what you're saying just now, mm -hmm. one of the things that really characterizes Maricel's book is, a, I think, a really sensitive and wonderful use of borderlands theory that unsettles its paradigms, but also expands them. So she uses Jason de Leon's really important Land of Open Graves mm -hmm. and sort of has it speak to the Caribbean which I think is brilliant. It's a brilliant move. It's a very courageous move because I think it's so desert focused. It is. But you make such a brilliant connection uh, in this book. Uh, so it's being able to move the sort of paradigms of Borderlands mm -hmm. through is so important and you've done it. Thank um, you. So can you say a bit more about something you touched on in your presentation, mm -hmm. which is that while there are primarily maritime borders in the Caribbean, there is also one particularly important land border, yeah. which you discuss at length in Crossing Waters. So why is it important to both distinguish and compare these two types of border geographies and spaces? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, uh, part of the, um, of the, when we're thinking about borders and the Caribbean, uh, well, certainly water um, works as a border, right? Functions as a border. It can also be a bridge. But we cannot forget that the island of Hispaniola is divided. You know, that's the, the one land border, human-made border, right, um, in the Hispanophone Caribbean. And this is a border that, you know, um, not too many people know about, right? Um, a lot more uh, scholarship is coming up for sure uh, mm -hmm. in the last several years. So, so that's getting stronger. And actually <laughs> studies that compare that border to the Mexico-US border, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, I, I'm thinking yeah, of the work of uh, Rebecca Hey Colon, uh, for instance, uh, and others, you know, who, mm -hmm. who have, uh, um, you know, engaged with, with this. But yeah, um, it is, uh, it, it, again, it's just mm -hmm. the idea that it's not one or the other. It's just that there's different borders mm -hmm. happening, right, mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the Caribbean, and we need to be paying attention to them. Uh, in the case of um, the land border, you know, between the Dominican Republic and Haiti, it, there's a long history there. Uh, as a matter of fact, right now, we are between the 2nd of October and the 8th of October. Uh, we commemorate, or people commemorate, the, the 1937 massacre uh, that dictator um, Trujillo ordered mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. along the border there. So we are in the midst of that. Um, so it is, yeah, it, 
issues of uh, U.S. empire and colonialism have everything to do with everything else, even mm -hmm. even the aquatic borders that that we're mm -hmm. dealing with in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this is shifting gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but can you say more about the role that Puerto Rico plays in the Caribbean? Mm -hmm. Both as an archipelago of its own, which I think is really important, that map that Maricel showed, it is an archipelago of its own, even as it's part of the bigger Antillean or Caribbean uh, archipelagraphy. Mm -hmm. um, so can you say a little bit more about Puerto Rico and all of this, uh, it, both throughout the book, but also in the specific chapters about it? Yeah, I mean, I could probably answer that in like a half hour so I will try to to be very brief um, well I already showed you it's an archipelago right even in Puerto Rico uh, even the discourse has changed because when I was a kid yeah they tell us it's an archipelago but it's it was really main island centered everything about the discourse so we're changing that you know um, and even sometimes I catch myself being very main island centered and I have to like recheck myself, right? Mm. Like it's an archipelago. Yeah, there's people <laughs> living in Vieques and Culebra and, mm. and it's not just the main island that, that I was used to. Um, so, but yeah, Puerto Rico it plays <coughs> that uh, double role that I engage with as both border and bridge. Mm. It can be a border because uh, it is uh, in, on the periphery of the US you know, mm -hmm. uh, jurisdiction, right? And if you are an undocumented uh, immigrant and you are uh, apprehended or intercepted there, you will be deported, right? So it, it's a border. And, but for those who manage to escape that, right? Um, it's a bridge, mm. it's a bridge. and. What happens is that many people think of Puerto Rico, again, as a stepping stone, like it's not necessarily gonna be the final destination, right? They're, they're embarking in these vessels, right, from, from Hispaniola uh, to Puerto Rico, crossing over, hoping to make it to Puerto Rico, maybe thinking I'll be there a few weeks, a few months, even a year, but then the final destination is the US, right? So pre-9-11, that movement was, easier because many people with um, uh, falsified documents, right, could get on a plane and head over to New York or wherever they were yeah. going. But since 9-11, you know, security and the militarization of Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and the wars around it, everything has really uh, mm -hmm. ramped up. So that has led to uh, many people not being able to do that final uh, uh, jump right from mm -hmm. Puerto Rico to to the U.S. Uh, mainland. This means that many Dominicans end up just staying in Puerto Rico. But you know, I, I think that's happening more now. Mm -hmm. But it's happened, you know, for for mm -hmm. a long time. So we've had migration, like my, even though there has been a Dominican presence, Cuban presence, Haitian presence in Puerto Rico for a long time. Um, the, the mass movements, you know, in the case of Cuba, happened after mm -hmm. the revolution, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of the Dominican Republic, after the 1965 Dominican Revolution, uh, and invasion, se second invasion of the U.S. Uh, to the Dominican Republic. And in the case of Haiti, during the Duvalier's uh, dictatorships, mm -hmm. especially in the 70s and 80s. Um, so that's when mm -hmm. that undocumented migration ramped up because it was really difficult for people in all of those places mm -hmm. to actually uh, have access to, to, to the documents or the permission, you know, some were, some were escaping dictatorships, you know, so mm -hmm. it, it was very complicated. Mm -hmm. And they saw Puerto Rico as a... Uh, also, the fact that Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory uh, symbolically makes it... Uh, is perceived you know, as part of the U.S., right? And so it's a way, like, you can somewhat achieve the American dream in Puerto Rico. Like, there's that mentality, although it's very difficult regardless. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Puerto Rico plays a double role, border and bridge. It mm -hmm. can go either way, and no one really knows how it's going to end up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So all of those shifts and changes you've just described bring to mind a key phrase that appears throughout Crossing Waters, mm -hmm. which is revised cartographies. Can you expand on this idea for our audience, especially in terms of agency as well as the examples 
visual and literary that you uh, bring into the book. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, so this idea of revised cartographies is not mine. It's uh, I'm quoting here um, Elizabeth de Lugray, and she she talks about these revised cartographies when she's talking about uh, islands and archipelagos and how um, they tend to be conceived of or seen mm. by empires, whether it was the Spanish Empire or the English Empire mm. or U.S., you know. There's this perception of islands and archipelagos as uh, isolated, uh, remote, uh, without any history, right? Um, like blank spaces, et cetera. And, and that really aligns with with their with the agenda of oh archipelagos and islands are easy to conquer conquer and, and colonize, you know, because they simply are, mm -hmm. okay? So that's the perception, right? Mm. Um, so Elizabeth de Lugray talks about, and, and others um, talk about these movements between islands and the currents between islands and, and the, yeah, what's happening. Um, and I kind of take that idea <clears throat> to talk about through those movements, because <laughs> for the purposes of let's say the US, which wants to control the region and has militarized the region, it's more useful to the US to think of the region as balkanized, like divided, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. islands don't have anything to do with each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and policy develops, you know, that way. And I'm thinking right now of the invasion of the U.S. to Haiti and the Dominican Republic around the same time period and policies instituted at the same time mm -hmm. and the separation that that created uh, between those nations. So thinking of that and then how undocumented migration, if the, if the goal of the of U.S., for instance, again, it could be other empires, is to keep them separate and more easily conquerable, the movement of, among them of people disturbs that, you know? It, like it's going against the goals of, of the US mm -hmm. and the authority over the region, okay? Um, so that's something that I, you know, um, engage with. And so especially the idea that undocumented intra-Caribbean migration, yes, breaks the image or, or the idea of isolation mm. and remoteness mm. and all of that. Um, so, yeah, I, I see that, you know, in many of the works that I engage mm -hmm. with. I mean, I'm thinking of the, there's a little excerpt from a Guillermo Cabrera Infante, the Cuban author, from the first chapter of his uh, Vista del Amanecer en el Tropico, where he's talking about the creation of Cuba, you know, how it emerges, you know, like back, way, way back, right? Um, and, and that's, um, it's a text where, he's really focusing on the idea that Cuba is also an archipelago, mm -hmm. you know? So it's not just Puerto Rico that's an archipelago. It's like Cuba is also an archipelago. And you can probably say the same thing about all the other islands. Mm -hmm. So it's archipelagos within an ar archipelago. Um, mm -hmm. So so that that's something that comes up there. And certainly Mayra Santos Febres' poems, the whole idea of, you know, the movement and the connection. So anytime there's a reference to a connection between islands that's disrupting the idea of isolation and that's kind of helping us reconceive of how we have mapped the Caribbean, mm -hmm. this specific archipelago. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know if I made much sense, but oh, yeah. I tried. So, and I think one of the things you're, uh, this is a brief aside, but one of the things that I think you're really touching on over and over again is how this really is shifting these studies. So, uh, uh, a lot of my work now is on desert studies, yeah. and one of the biggest yeah. texts for both island studies and desert studies is Gilles Deleuze's Desert Island. It's a blank space, an isolated space, a space of reinvention, emptiness, isolation, but you're showing over and over again that's not true. Even an island like Mona, which you talk about in the book, uh, really brilliantly, it's not empty, it's not yeah. gone, it's part of something, and in fact it's part of a really treacherous ocean current it's not just a sort of little desert island. So it's really brilliant, yeah. And thank you. And 
now that you mentioned Mona, as a, mm. because it is like desert-like, the conditions there. Um, it's interesting because in Puerto Rico, we grow up hearing about Mona and the Puerto Ricans in the house can correct me, right? But <laughs> we think about Mona, yeah, it's part of Puerto Rico, but it's really like a mystery, <laughs> right? Because you cannot go there unless you go, it's, it's a very, you have to rough it, like you have to take this boat, usually that's like, I don't know how many hours long through the Mona Passage, which I don't think I'll ever do, even though I, I'm dying to go to Mona. It's like a, um, it's protected, you know, by the U.S. Um, park services. Park right? services. Mm -hmm. uh, so you need to have permissions and it's really, really complicated, mm -hmm. right? But it's isolated. It feels remote. It feels mysterious. Um, but it wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. You know, during colonial, pre-Columbian times, uh, the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean, I mean, they lived there, you know, that they, they were going from island to island all the time. It was constant movement between these places. Mm -hmm. During the colonial times, it was also used to, uh, by the Spanish to keep enslaved Africans until they could be sold, uh, taken to, to ports where they would be sold. Then it became a place where maroon communities congregated. I mean, the history is really rich. Mm. I mean, there's all these amazing petroglyphs uh, in the caves, uh, amazing cave system. I've seen it in pictures. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's also a wonderful documentary about it by San, uh, Sonia Fritz. Um, so what I'm saying is that it's interesting that it's in these modern times that we think about it as mm -hmm. remote and isolated and like, mm -hmm. what is this? But before our times, this mm -hmm. was, you know, an area of a mm -hmm. lot of, flux and a lot of movement around there. Mm -hmm. So you have to think of what are the forces that are leading us to think mm -hmm. that way now. And part of it is that the U.S. kind of has mm -hmm. taken control over it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's part of it. It's more complicated yeah. than that. But. Well, I, I, uh, that part of the book is really actually exciting to read. So just because so little is known about it now. Yeah. Um, so prepare your questions because here's my last question. Yeah. Okay. So prepare them, think about them, you know, have them ready to go. Um, or so, comments. It doesn't have to be questions. Yeah. Um, so what are your some of your what are some of your favorite artworks that you analyze in the book, mm. and why are they important? So I'll go get the flipper if you want it. Mm. Um, well, you saw the, the Mar Caribe by Tony Capellan. That's one of my favorites for sure. Um, I mean, they're all my favorite. But, <laughs> uh, these two by mm. Sandra Ramos. Mm. Yo en el fondo del mar, me at the bottom of the sea. Uh, this is from 1994, right in the midst of the Cuban uh, Balsero crisis. And this one that she does is similar, right? So you have this suitcase, a used suitcase, and which you know, it's something that we carry when we travel. Uh, it, we usually pack, we usually mm. pack stuff that we will need, right? Mm. Uh, but in this case, she, so she has a whole series of these suitcases. Uh, but this is the one that I like the most and that had to do more with my, with the work I'm doing in the book. Uh, but it's like, if you look at the, it, it's, to me it's beautiful, right? Like if you look at the top, it's like, oh wow, this amazing marine life. And you can see it, you know, below here too. But like if you were just looking at the top, it's like, wow, all these fish and, you know, the coral and, well, mm -hmm. there's sharks, but it's all very Caribbean, right? Mm -hmm. But then the, the bottom part of it, which, you know, when you open it, you're looking mm -hmm. at the whole picture together, then you are confronted with the reality of death, death. And, mm -hmm. and you see the... Um, <coughs> The inner tubes? Or? The inner tubes, yeah. thank you. I only say it a million times in the book, inner tubes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the inner tubes, right? Uh, with people in the midst of drowning, right? And being taken by death, right? So it's obviously, it's a, it's a, it's a work along with this one too, that are really um, 
focusing on, on the fact that people die. So, so that's the other part of it, right? Um, there's so much about, well, there's, there's discussions about how to memorialize mm -hmm. the Middle Passage, mm -hmm. right? Because there are memorials on land, both in the Americas and in certain parts of Africa. But how do you memorialize the sea and pay respect to the lives that were lost in the trajectory, right? So connected to that and some of the works I look at, and again, which outright evoke the Middle Passage. Um, I discuss how there are links between the death of the Middle Passage and modern day undocumented migrants that die crossing because they're all resting on the bottom of the sea. Mm -hmm. But we cannot see it. It's out of our, we cannot see it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important the role that art plays mm -hmm. to memorialize and li literature, visual art, to memorialize those lives that were lost or are being lost mm -hmm. in the present. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and mm -hmm. it's all connected because it's again the majority of the people dying are <coughs> black people or people of color trying to cross. So mm -hmm. it's like afterlives of the Middle Passage mm -hmm. in a way. So mm -hmm. these are some of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Um, I'll go here and then Francisco. So, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for sharing all of this. I think, you know, I think this is amazing. And I just think that um, it's almost serving as an archaeology of the sea as well itself, mm -hmm. um, which I think it's so profound, especially with that last, th last thought that you had, because we know so little I read a statistic that we know so little about, we know so much less about the ocean than we do about right. space, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. space is like the space of dreams and like we want to do this and the future and conquer and all this. Mm -hmm. And we're so much closer to the ocean and yet we're like not acknowledging all of this like depth within, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so kind of like thinking about all of that um, and, and just sort of also thinking about memorials because I've, I also know that um, there's been research done um, that you know when there's memorials um it also serves as a way of like not repeating the past mm -hmm. um and i think this is just such a critical point um mm -hmm. that you're making that that we keep repeating the past um and sort of like the role of that mm -hmm. um i'm just curious um to see if you could like speak a little bit more about that connection between like dream and like death and and sort of like hopes mm -hmm. and also what is lost and like out of sight i guess mm -hmm. so you said the connection between dream yeah, like los sueños, como like hopes and dreams and like oh, all of this. Um, yes. Just thinking about, you know, like all of these migrants are moving because they're looking for something better. Yes. You know, um, yes. very similarly to what is happening in the desert as well. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's just like this erasure, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but you also mentioned that um, Puerto Rico has the potential to be a disruptor of the empire. And that sounds like a dream in a way. And so, I don't know, just thinking about the micro um, and like the people going through this, but also the macro um, systemic level of that, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, there's one art piece that I don't think I have. A, uh, I don't think I have it on, my, on the slideshow. Um, but if you have the book, um, it's called <laughs> uh, Illusions Espejismos by Sandra Ramos. It's this one here. And there's a couple, you can see them uh, floating on a mattress, on a bed. Um, they're naked, they're looking to the horizon. So like the bed becomes the raft. But then on the sky, the clouds have different shapes. And once a TV, once a boat. Um, oh, oh, you have yeah. even even the twin towers are there. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So this um, and then there's apples. I don't know if you see them. There's there's apples floating. Yeah. So obviously this is connecting with Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. and uh, also the big apple, but also the apple that. The, 
sin, right? And, and these people being portrayed as they want the material, uh, the riches, you know, that, and obviously it's the US because you have the Twin Towers, so obviously this is 1994. Um, so there's this materialism, other, oh, the baby is laying there too with them. There's oars. So yeah, it's like they're looking at the horizon, they're, they're dreaming of this better future, they're envisioning that, but what are the chances that they're actually going to survive the journey? So I think that's a piece that connects with what you were yeah. uh, trying to, um, to mention. I don't know if I answered your question, but, um, and then the idea of Puerto Rico being a disruptor of U.S. empire. That you said that that sounds like a dream. Yeah, at least like for like fighting that empire, you know. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I know, I'm delusional like for sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Just yes. Kind of I, I just needed to give it a twist yeah. somehow. Uh, yeah. I agree. <laughs> and so, um, coming back to this idea of you asking us to reconceptualize the idea of borderlands. Could you share with us how you situate the work of someone like Fred Arroyo, who grew up in Michigan with that idea of borderlands? Oh, that's interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, Fred Arroyo is a Puerto Rican author who grew up here in the area, in Niles, you know, so next door. Um, and it is interesting. I remember an interview he has talked about where another author told him that after reading his work, they would have never, like they thought this was a Mexican-American author writing his work because his experience is like farm working, you know, was uh, one of the main uh, ways that he survived, mm -hmm. right? Uh, or, or the characters, you know, in the work. So there's that whole idea of, he does play around with, with borders, you know, because he talks about the border between Michigan and Indiana, uh, and he, so he said, it, yeah, of course, you know, when we think about borders, it's obviously not just the, the physical, well, they can be physical, natural, but usually more often they are human made, right? Um, but there's so many borders, right? and so much uh, has been written about this. He does not engage, um, much with water mm. or the sea, so, mm. uh, but I don't know, it's, yeah, you're giving me something to think about for sure. Mm. Uh, thank you, thank you for that, yeah. Yes, go ahead, mm -hmm. okay. yes. Sorry. Okay, I just had a question for you. So since writing the book, how has your perspective on like the in-betweenness changed from beginning to end? That's mm. a good question. Mm. Um, Well, what I would say is that it's, after all the research, <laughs> it's much worse than I imagined. Mm. Yeah. I mean, just to put it simply, um, there is so much that we don't know. Yeah. And, and these are topics that don't tend to um, get much coverage. And, and to be honest, you know, I'm focusing on very specific groups. I'm talking about Cubans, I'm talking about Dominicans and Haitians, but these are not the only people mm -hmm. uh, crossing the Caribbean or being dropped off in Isla de Mona. Mm -hmm. People from China, people from Peru, mm -hmm. people from Guatemala, I mean, from all over. Mm -hmm. But they're following that trajectory of mm -hmm. thinking that they can easily make it from DR to Puerto Rico, mm. and the smugglers take them mm. those ways. So, so yeah, this is this is much more than just a Cuba issue, DR issue, Haiti issue, Puerto mm. Rico issue. Yeah. Mm. Maria Rosa. I love the book. It's so great. Uh, and the comment is about the wise critical turn that you have done. Uh, when you put the past and present through the middle passage, 
uh, in order to not to uh, erase blackness of the history mm. of the Caribbean at the level, but also to place the field of Hispano from Caribbean into Latinx. Uh, and mm. so that I thought it was genius. Uh, I mm. really, really love it because you, had, you were doing two things. Yeah. One, con dealing with the topic, okay, mm -hmm. and see how much the, the, the history of slavery is still there, so, yeah. so how colonialism yeah. and neocolonialism right. are actually in tie, but also a field turn mm -hmm. uh, and how the dialogues, right, how the hispanophone and the anglophone mm. Latinx mm -hmm. are, are in dialogue, and so yeah. that's why I thought that was, was great. When I made that part, I thought, oh, wow, mm. this is <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think overall we need to be talking more about what's happening in the um, Hispanophone Caribbean, and so hopefully this will mm -hmm. inspire some more conversations. There's a lot more work that needs to be done. Mm but it's not going to be done by me, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll still be doing some of this, but yeah. I think we have time so for I think, one oh, more oh, question. Okay. I think it can be had to be with dessert, but maybe for Francisco. <laughs> it's like I was thinking so many times, places that are not desert, I imagine as desert, mm. uh, mm -hmm. like uh, Patagonia, no, mm -hmm. they talk, and Desierto, Desierto, mm -hmm. sorry, Desierto was not a desert. Mm -hmm. But something that uh, a friend and colleague of mine has uh, done uh, is talking about desert makers, how you make a desert. Mm -hmm. And that connected with what Marisa was saying about Isla Mona. Mm -hmm. It was not a desert, I mean, it had a history. Mm -hmm. But how new groups have to make deserts in order to read the place mm. again. And so that's when I was listening to both of you, I was thinking about that, the mm. making of the desert. Yeah. Mm. That's one of the things I love about the book too, and also just thinking about the way that marooned in the English language means yeah. left, it yeah. isolated. Yeah. But I think what you're saying is that actually marooned or maronaje mm -hmm. is not this. In fact, there's a deep history. So going back yeah. to that sort of palimpsestic idea or the the currents of the ocean. It's just, it is one of the brilliant turns, you're right, uh, that this book makes yeah. in sort of insisting that we need to see these as layered or as in cross currents, mm -hmm. not as mm -hmm. in isolation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm adding my comment to yours, Maria Rosas, because it's, yeah, it's a really, it's, it's a brilliant book. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> So the last thing is uh, despedida from you, Maricel, of some kind. Oh. I think on the schedule. Okay. <laughs> I will miss you all. <laughs> no, thank you for coming, honestly, uh, and taking time to, to be here with me and, and supporting me. And yes, it means a lot. So thank you. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.